Hello everyone, this is the first video in a series on interpreting chest x-rays. My goal with this series is to be able to take people who literally know nothing about chest x-rays and teach them everything they'll need to know while taking care of patients, regardless of specific healthcare profession, with the one exception of a radiologist. If any of you happen to be a future radiologist, I think these videos will still provide a good, very early foundation for you, but I suspect you'll want to track down a more robust resource. The course will have 10 videos. Here's the structure. Lesson 1, that is this video, will cover the fundamentals of how an x-ray is taken and the physics involved. Please don't let the word physics scare you away. It's really basic and includes some pretty pictures. Lesson 2 will introduce a systematic approach to chest x-ray interpretation and demonstrate how x-ray shadows relate to normal chest anatomy. Lesson 3 We'll discuss how one assesses the technical quality of the film. Lessons four through eight will then each cover a subset of chest pathology that can be assessed with x-ray. These will include plenty of examples of common abnormalities. Lesson nine will discuss how to assess the placement of lines and tubes, as well as how to identify devices and findings consequent from prior surgeries, such as artificial heart valves. Finally, lesson 10 will be a self-assessment where unknown chest films are displayed alongside a brief clinical vignette, and after a chance for you to pause the video and study the films on your own, I'll review them. As I implied a moment ago, by the end of these 10 hit lessons, you should be able to identify the overwhelming majority of abnormalities visible on a conventional chest x-ray. The learning objectives of this video, lesson one, are first to be familiar with the basic physics and method of obtaining chest x-rays, and to be familiar with the basic chest x-ray views, that is the PA, lateral, and AP views. Along with the EKG, the chest x-ray is one of the most common diagnostic tests in medicine that does not involve drawing blood. There are many indications for getting a chest x-ray. They include evaluation of symptoms, which can be shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, fever, or unexplained weight loss, Evaluation of signs picked up on a physical exam, such as hypoxemia or an abnormal pulmonary exam. Evaluation of the placement of central lines, nasogastric tubes, and endotracheal tubes. Screening for a pneumothorax, which is air in the pleural space, after lung biopsy, central line placement, and pacemaker placement. Finally, a relatively specific indication is evaluation of suspected pacemaker lead fracture. There are a few situations you'll notice are not listed here. For example, routine chest x-rays prior to surgery in the overwhelming majority of patients are of no benefit and should be avoided. Also inappropriate are routine screening chest x-rays for lung cancer in smokers, although there may be benefit in screening chest CT scans, but that's a discussion for another day. So how does a chest x-ray actually work? We need a source of x-rays, which themselves are a form of electromagnetic radiation. X-rays are carried by photons, just like visible light, but have higher frequencies and thus higher energies, so they penetrate tissue much better. Unfortunately, these high-energy photons can cause DNA damage leading to cancer, which is why x-ray exposure should be generally be limited. To detect the presence of x-rays, we'll need something called, appropriately enough, a detector. For the first 100 years of x-rays in medicine, the detector was a photographic plate or film. I'll add a sheet of unexposed x-ray film here. Now, however, most hospitals have replaced these with digital detectors, which allow for real-time viewing as well as improve post-exposure digital manipulation. Finally, of course, we'll need a patient to stand in between the source and the detector. This patient is in the typical position for a chest x-ray. She's facing away from the source, hands on her hips, and chest against the detector. The reason to put her hands on her hips is essentially to keep the arms from obscuring the view of the thorax. The reason she is standing in a way that intuitively seems backwards will be discussed in lesson five. Now we have our source, our detector, and our patient. So we'll turn on the x-ray for a very brief predetermined length of time, and x-rays, that is high energy photons, will shoot out of the source. 
Some of these will pass right through the patient, some will be absorbed by the interposed organs and tissues, and some will be scattered. For the purpose of examining the X-ray film, it's actually the pattern of photons that are blocked which are of interest, as these create the shadows of the internal organs. So what are the factors that determine how many photons pass through a particular spot on a patient to reach the detector? In other words, the factors which determine shadow brightness. There are essentially three. The first is the density of the interposed tissue. Technically, this depends not just on the literal density as mass per unit volume, but also independently on the atomic mass of the particles in the interposed tissue. Let me show you some examples. So here is our table, and on it I'll place an empty glass jar. The jar is filled just with some air. On the far side of the jar is our photographic film. Notice that it starts off white. The x-ray source is then brought in. We fire some x-rays at the jar, which of course aren't in the visible spectrum like this might suggest. As the x-rays are traveling across the table, the ones that either pass around the jar or through the jar interact with the film. Here's what's left. Any part of the film where many x-rays struck has turned black. Parts of the film where no x-rays struck have remained white. And the parts of the film where a modest amount of x-rays struck show various shades of gray. Since air has a very low density, x-rays easily pass through the jar and thus the jar appears empty on the film. Note that the metal lid has blocked nearly all of the x-rays, which has left a sharply demarcated rectangular patch of white unexposed film. Here's some more examples. Next, we can take a jar of water and do the exact same thing. Expose it briefly to x-rays, which also exposes the film behind it. In this case, water is denser than air, so it blocks more x-rays, and therefore the jar's contents now appear gray on the film. It's important to realize that even if the fluid in the jar is completely 100% transparent, it will still block x-rays and therefore look gray. The fraction of x-rays a substance blocks has absolutely nothing to do with its color or degree of translucency within the visible light spectrum. And now for a more interesting test subject, what happens when x-rays strike a skull? You can see that the resulting image is lighter than the jar of water, but not pure white like the image formed from the jar's metal cap. In summary, there is a spectrum of radio densities into which different materials fall. Those that allow most x-rays through are called radiolucent and appear black or near black on x-ray. Those that block most x-rays are called radioopaque and appear white. For medical x-rays, there are essentially four classes of material. Air, which is the most radiolucent, Next is fluid and soft tissue, then bone, and finally metal. The next factor which determines shadow brightness is the thickness of the structure being x-rayed. If we take a single, relatively thin glass of water and expose it to x-rays, most will pass through, resulting in a very dark image on the film. If instead of one glass of water, we line up two glasses in a row and shoot x-rays through both, twice as many will be blocked. The resulting image will therefore be more gray because the specific part of the film corresponding to the shadow of the glasses have been relatively less exposed. Finally, if we shoot x-rays through three glasses of water, the image of the glass will be brighter still. In summary, the thicker the structure, the brighter it will appear on the x-ray film. The third and last factor is the duration of exposure. For the x-ray interpreter, this factor is only relevant when trying to understand a technical error in image acquisition. Imagine we have two glasses of water again, and I'm going to give these a very short or brief x-ray exposure. During that brief amount of time, few x-rays have an opportunity to pass through the water, so the film where the glass's shadow was cast is relatively underexposed, and thus is relatively bright. If I use a medium exposure, the film behind the glass will receive more x-rays, and thus the glass appears a little darker. Finally, if I use a very long exposure, even though the glasses of water are in the way, there is enough time for many x-rays to pass through, so the glasses appear fairly dark on the film. 
the bottom line, short exposures lead to images that are too bright and long exposures lead to images that are too dark. This is the opposite of what most people initially expect because intuitively we assume that all film starts off black and turns white after exposure to light. But remember, x-ray film is the opposite. Let's return to our patient who has been patiently waiting for us in the radiology department. And let's fire some x-rays at her. You can see that some pass through, some get absorbed, and a few even get scattered around the room. The result is an image formed on the photographic film of the shadows cast by the various structures in the patient's chest. And here is that result. From the pattern of white, black, and gray, we can infer things about those chest structures. For one, this area here, because it is generally relatively dark, it must correspond to an air-filled structure, a lung. This area here, which is a medium gray in brightness, must correspond to a structure composed of either fluid and or soft tissue, in this case, the heart. Since the layout of the human body is amazingly consistent from person to person, each major line and shape on this x-ray corresponds with a known and identifiable anatomic part. I'll review these parts in lesson two, but before then, there are two quick practical things to point out first. It may have happened so fast that you did not notice it, but when I removed the film from the detector stand, I flipped it around horizontally. The consequence of this is that the left side of the film, as we are looking at it, actually corresponds to the right side of the patient, and vice versa. This puts the x-ray in the same orientation as if we were standing in front of the patient and looking directly at him or her. If that seems a little weird right now, it will probably feel intuitive after examining just a dozen or so examples. The second practical thing to mention is the idea of chest x-ray views. In radiology, the term view refers to the orientation of the person relative to the beam of x-rays. At this point, there are three views to know. The first view is the most important and the one you've already been shown. It's called the PA view, which stands for posterior to anterior meaning the x-rays entered the body squarely in the back and exited squarely out of the front. In most cases, the PA view will automatically be accompanied by the lateral view. As the term implies, the lateral view is the two-dimensional projection of the patient's internal structures as seen from the side. The PA view should be distinguished from another situation common in the hospital where patients may be physically unable to stand due to weakness, confusion, surgical wounds, or invasive tubes. In that circumstance, when the patient is in a hospital bed, a portable x-ray source will be wheeled into the patient's room. An x-ray film will be placed into a metal tray and slid behind the patient's back, and the x-rays will be passed through the patient front to back. This is formally known as the AP view, though more commonly known as a portable chest x-ray. AP films are inferior in quality to PA films for a number of reasons, some of which will be discussed in Lesson 3 and some in Lesson 5. That concludes this introduction to chest x-rays. If you found it helpful, please remember to like or share it. The next video will discuss a systematic approach to interpretation as well as normal chest x-ray anatomy.